Good evening, welcome to tonight's webinar. We are talking about maintaining land performance post weaning this evening. Uh, my name is Liz Genova. Um, I'm going to be leading you through some of this evening. But what we've got, the plans for tonight, is we've got a little bit of instruction. Um, what is ROSA, so Register of Sheep Advisors. We've then got Leslie, uh, who's going to be talking about ewe management and worm control. Pete Bone talking about mineral nutrition and testing. Myself talking about grass and forage quality. And then we've got a good chunk of time for Q&A. So as you, as, we, as you listen to the webinar, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A button that you find on the screen and then we'll deal with them at the end. Um, so yeah, and there's time at the end to ask those questions, but if you feel, if anything strikes you as you go through, please type it in. Um, so the first thing we need to do is welcome Leslie and Pete. So Leslie, uh, renowned within the within the sheep advisory world i won't embarrass you with how many years you've been doing it leslie you can inform me we can inform us all of that later um but thank you very much for joining us this evening i look forward to it i'm also pete um who background very much in ruminant nutrition particularly focusing on minerals so again thank you very much for joining us this evening pete i'm just going to quickly take you through what is the register of sheep advisors so the what we're aiming to achieve with it is that we would like a group of qualified and well-informed advisors who support engaged sheep farmers to become more profitable and sustainable. It was an idea that came by Phil Stocker, who is the chief exec of the NSA, um, and we're, Rosa is working alongside NSA and BASIS to, um, to develop a continuous development programme for sheep advisors. And that the overall ambition is to ensure sheep farmers can access the best and most appropriate advice to ensure their business will be ready for the upcoming opportunities and challenges. So that's sort of setting the scene of what it is. So it is a CPD scheme. Who is it for? It's for anybody who is working with sheep farmers to make informed decisions or want to develop their wider knowledge. Could be independent advisors and consultants, nutritionists, vets, reps, uh, SQPs or rammers, technical specialists, environmental advisors, field officers, and the list continues. But it's back to that, who is, who is helping sheep farmers make informed decisions. It's important to remember there's two types of membership. We have the full membership that's for more experienced advisors. And we've also got an associate membership for those who are just starting out their journey in the, sorry, starting out their journey to developing a career as an advisor in the sheep industry or don't necessarily work directly with sheep farmers yet but want to and, and just want to sort of experience their network and we're also working with training providers to ensure activity that's relevant to this group of people are registered for points so how will it work uh there um, there'll be some details in terms of the website shortly an application form is submitted and then independently scored and again you can request to be full or associate. Um, the fee is £75 per year so that's payable uh, at the point of joining and then we need to start collecting points so the target is 40 points per year roughly one point per hour for sort of uh, this sort of activity for webinars, two points per hour for more um, sort of small group working. There'll be a quarterly newsletter just to make sure you're up to date with what's happening and then we'll also um, promoting events and activities that those that points are awarded to. And so this is if you're interested in a bit more information there's the website that was launched today so sheepadvisors.co.uk you can email the address on the screen and you can also follow at sheep advisors on Twitter so that's the best place to go for a bit more information. At this point, I'm going to hand you over to Leslie, who's going to take you through uh, her sort of 10, 15 minutes of her thoughts on, um, oh, I'm on my, that way, um, in terms of managing the weaned lamb. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Hopefully we can um, share this all right. I might need to go back one. Okay. So good evening, everybody, and um, we're going to have a little bit of a, a little bit of a whistle stop of a few things to think about at this time of year. Uh, it is an extremely critical time of year for anybody dealing with sheep farmers and sheep flocks. Um, if we don't get it right in the next few weeks, um, then we will be paying the price for quite some time. So, so thanks Liz, for the opportunity to talk about this at this stage. 
Um, now, I think everybody's quite, should be, I hope, that's on here, quite familiar with the fact of the production cycle of the sheep year um, and the fact that, you know, at each stage, there are things which are going to be influenced, particularly by the body condition of the ewe, obviously the nutrition at the time as well. But I think we hopefully we're all familiar with the fact that in all of these times, these issues will be <clears throat> influenced and that the recovery of body condition, BCS, between weaning and topping is absolutely critical. Now, historically, we have had targets that we work to. Arguably, I would say those lowland ones are slightly on the low side from experience over the last 10 years or so, um, doing a lot more work on body condition. But we're used to targets. What we're not quite so used to, I think, is that we always thought that providing we hit those targets at specific times, it was not irrelevant, but it didn't really matter too much whether they dipped outside of that range significantly. Um, and what we've really learned in the last few years is that it does, that what happens between those targets is really important and we don't want to stray too far from them. And also, if we get it wrong, the effect is not just on the next stage of the production cycle, but it lasts for 12 months or more. Um, and this has been one of the really big things. We're waiting for a lot of stuff to be published and from Neris Wright's um, PhD, which is finished now. But um, we're now looking at this area around about weaning and weaning as an active tool being really important. And if we get it wrong, we won't just pay for it in terms of ovulation and rates and topping and through. We will be paying for it all the way through to the performance of lambs, which we ostensibly talking about a little bit tonight. So it's really important that we get this right. So the first question is when to wean. Um, I think the first comment to make is most farmers leave it far too late. I would think probably in my experience, you may disagree, but mostly it's 16 to 20 weeks if you actually work it out. Whereas in reality, we want it to be nearer 12. I would say 10 to 12 weeks for most lowland frocks, certainly with outliers of nine to 14. But generally speaking, what you will find is that a lot of people are leaving it too late. And we've got to think of weaning as a management tool. It's not just something that gets done. It's an active management tool and it's an active management tool for the lambs, because, of course, we want to, if we can, maintain their growth post weaning and not let happen as done on a lot of farms is that by weaning they've had already had a period of being stagnant for several weeks and we want our use to regain body condition score on the basis of, of what I was just saying about the, the longer term the longitudinal effects of us getting that wrong not just from the next point in the production cycle but all the way through to next year. So one of the main points I want to make for you tonight is to say, look, the decisions we make in the next few weeks will impact on land performance in 2022. And if we get it really wrong and don't take control, then you know it will impact no matter what we do in terms of feeding in late pregnancy and so on. I think that has come home to us really strongly. So, you know, what we look at now, um, these are lamb growth rates, obviously. We're looking at these um, target points at, at 56 days, eight weeks, and at 90 days, um, which, you know, is round about that 12 week, 12, 13 week mark, um, where we're looking at trying to be able to hit, um, just as a guide, 20 kilos and 30 kilos, equates roughly to 300, just under 300 grams a day um, between all of those points. Um, why is that so important? And it's important because now, if we've already got that wrong, what we know is that the lambs that are down here below target at eight weeks are also the same ones when we follow them through within the software. They're the same ones that are down the bottom at 90 days. So if they've got if they're off target at, at eight weeks, they're going to stay off target. So even now where we are in terms of lamb growth rate, if we haven't had the early growth, we're not going to be able to make it up. So you'll get where I'm coming from really now. This is quite a long-term thing. Uh, and as an, an advisor or a consultant, you know, never put yourself in a position where you're going to put things right in the flock in one year that's got these sorts of problems because it will take longer than that. And one of the KPIs that we use now, I certainly use this a lot, 
um, is you know those lambs falling below that sort of 85% of the target, in this case 17 kilos, really important KPI and it really concentrates the mind because they're the ones that are down the bottom, they're the ones with the wastage, the ones that are going to be the runts and lose the money at the end of the day. The ones that are growing faster, they're taking care of themselves, it's the wastage at that end. So what, what's happening with lambs? Again, a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but if we just look at this um, along the bottom there, weeks from birth, and this is the energy sources for lambs, um, the green line being lamb intake, what the lamb actually requires to optimise growth rate. Um, and we can see, I think, three things from this. Number one, the importance of ewe milk, up to three or four weeks, absolutely sacrosanct. Um, and that will have a massive influence on where we are at the six to eight week stage. Of course it will. So ewe body condition score, how well primed she is, is going to be critical. The second one which surprises most people is that by four weeks, the jaws have opened and ewe milk is no longer enough to keep lambs growing optimally. Um, this is twin lambs. They need a source of high energy, be that hopefully good quality pasture, which is being done by good grazing techniques, or then you need to think in terms of perhaps putting something in by way of creep. And I've had people this year where we've had to do it because we haven't had the pasture and I want the eight week to 10 week waits. And so we've been prepared to put creep in temporarily to get there. Again, if we hadn't done that, we would still be looking at lambs underperforming for the rest of the year because we wouldn't be able to make it all up. Um, so, you know, the U performance is controlling a lot of it, but equally, we've got to be thinking about way back in time. We've got to go back in time to be able to um, keep things going and make sure we're getting optimal growth. In terms of um, requirements for U's for body condition score, um, this is a table I did straight out of AFRC because we didn't have one, basically. Um, looking at energy requirements and turning that into kilograms of grass dry matter according to body condition score. This would be over about a 10 week period. Um, and we um, sense checked it in the KPI project and yeah, it's pretty accurate. So I would still be using this. Um, but again, you know, you can look at it, you can see a U that's still in body condition score three is going to need a thousand um, megajoules of ME. The one in body condition score one, if you can persuade to get there, is nearly double. Um, and the implications, obviously, for grass dry matter are almost nearly double too. And if you look at that in a flock context, this was one of the KPI flocks, then you can see, you know, the numbers of views in different condition scores and uh, amounting to over 100,000 kilos of dry matter to be able to get all of that flock back up to or maintained in body condition score three plus. After 10 weeks, we didn't get there with all of the leaner ones. It does take time and it does take planning. And then really, I think, you know, because of that, because of those really long term effects of body condition score, the U's have to take priority at this stage. So you're really asking you shouldn't be asking, have I got enough dry matter for my ewes? They are the priority if it's a breeding flock and you don't want to completely um, ruin next year. You've got to start looking for dry matter for lambs. And Liz will talk more about this later. It may well be that it is a forage crop of, of some description would provide extra dry matter. It might be you have to um, commit the sin of selling stores because you haven't got that um, dry matter. That's going to be, and they're already talking store prices up this year, so it might not be a bad thing. It might be you have to do a little bit of hard feed. I would argue, though, that decision should have been made weeks ago, because if you were doing the weights and monitoring them, um, as I've said, you'd have realised by grass availability where we were in April and, and, and through May, we needed to put some energy in then. A lot more efficient for younger lambs like this than it is to wait till the 90 days plus when their food conversion is dropping off um, at the edge of a cliff. What we don't want is to end up with feed which is often what happens is people haven't got enough dry matter and, and they end up with the ewes not doing as well as they should and lambs that are stores by default rather than design um, with all sorts of other issues. So it's all about planning, I think, and starting now and, and getting things in order for next year. So hopefully, you know, it'd be nice to think that we had some really nice stuff to put lambs onto um, post weaning. And, uh, you know, if they're going on to 
good quality grazing. I mean, obviously you need to introduce this a bit carefully, but um, going on to good quality grazing that's relatively low, very low in terms of worm burden, um, then that's the point where you can think about weaning earlier. If you go too much below 10 weeks, um, or anything below 10 weeks and you're going to put them onto dirty pasture that is a bit of a brick wall so you know if you're going to do it you need to think about the sort of pasture you're going to um, and the reason for that is that you know and it's a good another good reason for worming lambs is that what we're trying to do of course as well as to provide them with the good grazing and can and and take them on um, is that the worm burden on contaminated pasture is rising rapidly once we get to this time of year, you know, the big surge in pasture larvae is beginning to take off. And that's what we're really trying to avoid. And we'll hold back lambs if we don't. And, um, you know, all too familiar, we'll end up with um, jokers like that. But again, we're good lambs pre-weaning um, or earlier on. And then they run into this surge. And if they stay on the ewes to 16 to 20 weeks, it's one of the best reasons why lambs start to um, go downhill and, and pancake really in terms of their, their growth rate. So weaning itself um, and worming, um, always I would say do a FEC test, you know, at or just before weaning. So you know whether or not these animals actually do need treatment at that stage. It can be so easy to just say, well, we're gonna worm them up weaning anyway. But if you do affect, depending on where it is, you can then you know, think in terms of perhaps using a TST, a targeted treatment regime, whereby um, you, know, you can leave the best growing, the heaviest animals untreated on the basis that they will have a much lower effect. So again, you're, all, you're guarding against um, heavy selection for resistance, whilst also taking care of those animals which have got a high effect and do need treatment. So that's something to really bear in mind. A lot of people will want to worm and wean at the same time. And um, as a matter of course, and it's not always necessary. Uh, and the other thing, uh, the other tip I would say is, if you're weaning, always take the ewes away and let the lambs stay for four or five days and if you are treating that works really well if you're going on some low um very low contamination pasture because it means you can drench leave them to pick up a small burden so you're not heavily selecting for resistance and at the same time there's a lot less stress on them they'll settle a lot more easily if you take the, you know, the old girls away and leave the lambs in their social groups for a few days before you move them Finally, just one final point, um, the use of group four, um, five. Uh, there seems to be a misconception that weaning is the right time to do this. Um, weaning is not the right time to do it in most circumstances. Um, and the reason for that is that what we're trying to do when we're using a group four, five, if you like, as a, as a break dose, is that we're trying to clear up um, the worm burden that has sort of accumulated in lambs after several treatments. So it depends how many treatments they've had, but say they've had two, maybe they've had three, if they had an nematodirus earlier on. The worms that are left inside those lambs eat after each treatment that are resistant, what don't die, they're in there for several months. So they accumulate. And what we're trying to do with that drench with a group four or five is to break that accumulation. And we need to do that later in the season rather than earlier. And there's certainly no point in doing it if it's the first stretch of the season. That's not what we're trying to do. Um, you need to leave it and each farm is different. So that you're getting that maximum benefit from removing that burden from the lambs because that will help them grow. They're not going to carry those resistant worms, but also having the break effect whereby you're doing a bit of a reset in terms of the damage done for selection in the season. So that point would be that it's unlikely weaning is the right time to do that. Not necessarily always, but very unlikely. Um, my final slide is just really where I am these days with this. For me, body condition score is absolutely the critical KPI um, for breeding flocks as a consultant, as an advisor out on farm. I know now that if I can get the body condition score right, the range right, if I'm intolerant of ewes that are um, thin, I find the lame ones, you find um, in, in, you know, early indication of perhaps an iceberg disease, 
If you use that as your KPI, it's actually amazing what degree of control you and your, your client will have. Um, and I found this the other day, and I think it kind of sums it up. You know, KPIs are an actionable scorecard that keeps your strategy on track. They enable you to manage, control, and achieve desired business results. That was for a business. I'd suggest that's very, very good mantra um, for a breeding flock as well. So, um, Liz, I'm going to leave it at that for my plea. But, you know, as sheep advisors, some will be more experienced than others. But for me, this is um, the key to it. Thank you. So we're just moving over to Pete. And, and, and as, uh, sorry, as I said earlier, if you have any questions, please type them in to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. Right, can I just check that the screen is showing, please? Uh, yeah, it's still on your note screen, though. Lovely, thank you. That's fine. We'll go to full screen now. Lovely, there we are. Thank you, Liz. <clears throat> uh, thank you indeed, Liz and Phil, for tonight's uh, invitation to come and uh, chat with you this evening. Uh, Leslie, thank you very much indeed. Leslie and I share quite a lot of common ground, but tend to work in <clears throat> slightly different spheres. So in terms of who I am, Pete Bone, for those of you who know me, based down in the Cotswolds, work over the whole of the UK and um, work really more on the mineral nutrition side of livestock in general. So in terms of uh, what we'd like to do tonight is using Leslie's words as well, my slides sort of saying the same thing really, is a whistle stop tour. Have a quick look about mineral nutrition uh, for ewes and lambs. Am I going into detail tonight? No, I just want to try to make you think. I want to look at some protocols for testing, talk about the inputs, um, talk about the inputs and stop testing, but also try to raise the question for monitoring as well. And I think Liz and Phil and Sean will um, take questions um, as we go forward. So just um, to bring us into the area of mineral nutrition. And before I start this, I normally put a slide up um, it doesn't really matter what sphere of livestock production that we're working in. But before we do consider mineral problems, Leslie has spoken quite heavily about dry matter intake, body condition, also came into um, disease, infection, etc. So please consider these things um, before we actually go headlong into trying to decide whether we have a mineral imbalance. And I hope that we can explain more about mineral imbalances than we can about excesses and deficiencies, because it's trying to get those balances right. But the key is in the feeding. The key is in the dry matter that you make available. So that dry matter, I'll come to that more later, is the key of driving those mineral elements from your own production and trying to get those in the best balance that we can. So we look at mineral elements, but very much in the sheep world, we tend to focus on the micro elements, the trace elements. Um, and commonly those would be things like iodine, selenium and copper, zinc, etc., which is all fine. But we shouldn't really forget the major elements because without frame, we will never get the weight gain that we want. So good growing frame, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, tied up with that. So looking at forages that have a potency to give those areas. Potassium we do need, so we need to think about that potassium, but also potassium become our enemy. So we need to be careful about that potassium. And I think we, as an industry, particularly when we're transitioning use towards pregnancy and lambing, perhaps need to consider some of the work in the dairy world, which looks at cation anion balance and whether some of the minerals that we're seeing in some of our forages are actually too high for these sheep to deal with and envelop us developing into milk fevers and other associated problems. So I think my plea from my macro side of this tonight is, ladies and gentlemen, think about that macro supply and whether we can meet it through the cycle of our sheep farming process. But we also have connection, connections here this evening with things like sulfur, and that's very, very important for rumen function, but it's also becoming more and more important in grassland production. But bear in mind, I'm not saying at all that that sulfur is wrong for us to try to get a better grassland uh, output and increase dry matter. 
but we need to remember that the animal doesn't need too much of it. So again, trying to think about these balances. So macro elements important, and perhaps my message is think a little bit harder about them. Also, we are seeing um, still evidence in this country of, in, of problems with cobalt deficiency at time of weaning. But remember again what Leslie said, make that dry matter available to those stock. If they cannot consume dry matter, they're not gonna get the cobalt into them. And that's particularly true of young lambs. So we need to try and make every effort to make that cobalt available if we can through the type of cropping that we're making available in the grazing platform. And we can talk about other elements quite a lot, but I think you're gonna to start to see zinc um, being focused on quite a lot in the sheep world and its connections with cobalt. And some of us are beginning to think that we've perhaps made a bit of a slip up when we see cobalt signs, are we confusing those with the signs of zinc deficiency at the same time? So a few messages there about what might be happening in the future. So think about the balance, think about the supply, but always try to drive the supply from the homegrown forage if possible. So then coming in to look at some of the issues that we can see with animals that are well described from a point of view of um, understood and defined problems that can come with imbalances of minerals. So milk fever being excess potassium, perhaps phosphorus, We've got other elements that are tied up with that. Grass staggers or magnesium deficiency, then really the clear protagonist here is too much potassium in the diet. Sometimes, yes, a complete deficiency of magnesium, but we need to understand what's going on. So there's a message here about planning, and you'll see that coming through in the next slide. Sometimes where we see ewes retaining quite a lot of um, fluid in them, can that be to do with upsets of too much potassium chloride, et cetera, upsetting the internal balance of the animal, and then looking at other more, perhaps um, detailed information about where we see retained placenta or immune function. Is it uh, basically a balance or an imbalance of not enough copper, too much zinc, too much manganese, not enough manganese, what do we need to do? Stillborn lambs very much still connected with selenium and iodine imbalances. And the key to this really is understanding that selenium, if not made available in the anim animal, will not allow iodine to utilize properly. So when we're actually looking into our animals to see, we need to understand that selenium iodine level. Then uh, things like the chats that we might have over a market gate when we're allowed to do these things again more about coat colour changes, wool quality, are things like copper or excess iron, molybdenum and sulphur. Um, and can we start to look to identify what's going on in our, uh, in our crops and affect uh, our animals for the good or the bad? So if we take breath for a second, because this is whistle stop this evening, in terms of one of the keys that I like to get people to think about is testing protocols. So if we have an inclination or knowledge that our animals are suffering with some type of mineral imbalance, let us look at what we're feeding them. And in the grazing sense, let's look at the grazing platform. Can we pre-plan this? Yes, we can take samples before we stock in the field. Can we analyze? And you can see on the screen a clear analytical level of some 16 or 18 trace elements and macro elements. Um, that can be purchased independently or through suppliers in the marketplace. So if we think that we've got issues with say, um, a selenium deficiency, because that is actually reporting quite low on that uh, featured slide, then that actually aids us to look at what we might do to uncover our animal situation. So we can actually do our forages that are in bales or in clamps. We can do our grazing platforms, any form of growing crop, any form of conserved forage that I've just said. We can obviously look at um, feed tickets, but if you're feeding blends and not adding mineral or you're feeding home mixes, we can analyze all that for its mineral background. So the mineral background being what is supplied by the crop. But um, sorry, uh, being supplied by the crop or the uh, feeds that you're buying. Livestock drinking water is something in the industry that we still do not give enough credence to. So there are sometimes clear signs on farms that we're 
supplying too much iron, perhaps sulfur if it smells the water. But water is a clear adjunct for room and development. So we need to make sure that we can have accessible water, portable water and quality water. If you wouldn't drink it, don't expect your livestock to drink it. So we have the ability to get these tests done. Turnaround times about 10 working days. If you're going into the open market to buy these, you should be looking to pay around 35 to 40 pounds per test. That's the whole lot of elements as you see them on the screen this evening. So we can look at these areas that I've already said, we can get them done and we can get them out to you with some results and some hints and tips to, to see what these animals are consuming. And then if we look at testing protocols, well, we can look at quite a lot of areas around, but obviously the standards is that we can look for blood. Um, so we can get blood analysis taken, get those off to laboratories. But if you look in to see where the animals are on low supply from the inputs, it gives yourselves or your vet practices more of a, a window of opportunity to be looking for the correct things. We also have liver. There's a growing number of, um, I would say, a small band of veterinary surgeons actually prepared to do live liver biopsy on ewes now. So that gives us another window of opportunity. So we can look at that. We've also been looking at the use of urine sampling. So um, it's not one of the easiest things to do. So what we've been doing is strapping up user prolapse harnesses and just literally putting plastic bags on the back end. And that's enough to collect the samples of urine you want. That's particularly useful for us for major minerals. And it also is be possibly becoming useful for iodine as well. So that's something that um, we're looking to try to develop within the industry and getting more information as we go forward. So what we're really talking about here is trying to get analysis done to prove the need for the supplements that you may need to purchase from the suppliers, whether those come in injectable bolus, buckets, blocks, whatever it is you're buying, and making sure that you need those and that they are going to give you a financial reward. And that is gain of live weight daily gain on meat sold. So again, we need to make sure these things are going to be used and used correctly. Monitoring, we can come back to blood and blood samples. So that's easy enough to do. And liver, we can actually do, as I've said, is live liver biopsy on older mature animals. But don't forget to think about lambs going up into the lorries and going to point of kill. Most of the factors will oblige you by taking liver analysis so that we can see whether the products that we've been using have stayed in the liver or whether they've done some good. And we can start to build up a picture about what's going on. And also just coming back to the area of treatment, thinking about the planning and thinking about making time to do these things. So if you see a cobalt deficiency in your mind's eye, I would suggest by the time that you start to pull blood, most of the damage has been done. So thinking again about what Leslie said about making these crops available, making the dry matter available for the lambs, particularly if the dry matter is there and we know the mineral content is there, we shouldn't run into too much. So testing and monitoring is a great use. So tips to take home and think about. I've mentioned it probably 30 or 40 times in this already. Dry matter intake is the key to all aspects of mineral nutrition supplying background elements. So we need to understand what our crops are supplying. I'm just going to reference soil here because many people will start to do soil analysis thinking that what's in the soil will actually be mirrored in the crop. You would be wasting your money in the first instance to do that. Please, please always go to the crop that is being consumed. The soil may come into play later as a way of managing uh, things at a later day. Act earlier, aid planning. So think about when we're um, putting, say, um, slow dissolving elements into animals. Does that actually impact on when we house? What are we going to feed when we house? When are these things best done? What are we actually trying to target? So have a think about that planning and how it affects always, always test to understand what the animal's telling you. Um, sample the stock really to confirm the need. So that testing and confirmation of need is, to my mind is vital. 
as I've said, plan the supplements over the year, monitor and try to engage improvements. So I've said quite a lot in a short time. Hopefully it's made a little bit of sense, but we'll try and give opportunity to answer questions and discuss them. Liz, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Pete. You can, I'll um, just start showing my slides. You'd think I'd know how to do this now, wouldn't you? Hopefully, you can see my main screen. Is it with the notes? Yes, it is, Liz. With the notes or without the notes? It's with the notes. I'll try Managing. to stop it again. Yeah. Better now. You've still got managing notes oh. at the bottom in purple. Uh-uh. How about that? Let me just get rid of something on my screen. Just <laughs> so you've got a white screen, your logo, right in the middle, managing the wean lamp. Perfect. Thanks, Pete. Uh, right. Sorry about that. So, uh, so I'm going to talk a bit more about the grazing side and a bit more on the grass side. So there's been a question from Lupo coming through on this graph, so I'll give him a bit more time to look at it. I quite, um, I know Leslie presented it before, but I just think it's a really interesting slide to think about because it's an important one to, when we start trying to persuade farmers to think about their weaning age. It's quite an important part to get them to think about this competition element that's starting to build between the ewes and the lambs as they approach weaning. So the trigger points uh, for weaning can be altered, but a lot of the time it is about when are those ewes really competing for lambs for the best bits of that pasture. And so as those lambs start to eat more and are becoming more and more dependent on the dry matter that's in front of them, um, the more important it is to remove those ewes away. And also, as Leslie mentioned, it gives more chance for those ewes to go um, and recover. And also, as we switch them from a sort of lactation mode into a dry mode, um, during their, they are able to put more condition on. Um, and from a grazing perspective, um, they are a really useful tool. So to have a big rock of ewes marauding around the farm, tidying up pastures is a really useful pasture management tool as well. So that's another advantage of weaning them slightly earlier than, we, than traditionally. So when we think about quality, what do we mean? And um, I'm generally looking down in fields and sort of trying to have an understanding of what proportion of that, uh, the field in front of them is leaf, green leaf. So you can see on the slide on the extreme left is this sort of optimum quality. And generally that's sort of 11 and a half ME around about that can be a bit higher. We're looking green leaf, we're looking clover and high quality swords. As we start to put up more stem that's likely to be happening from this point of the year onwards, as that stems, as the plant starts to push up more stem, you're basically diluting the quality of that with more roughage, so more structural fibre, and you drop the quality down to probably around about 10 and a half M ME. Then when we go again, so to the poor quality, we've got the buildup of dead material. Um, we've got some stem, we've got some seed heads, and that's when you drop it down to sort of around about eight megajoules, not exactly, but exactly there, but in terms of the concepts there. So you've got green leaf, you've got stem, and then you've got dead material. And what we're really trying to put those weaned lambs on, is, weaned lambs onto is this optimal quality. My previous statement about this big rock of dry ewes, they would do an amazing job on that poor quality. Doing the thinner ones might be somewhere else on the farm, but certainly the, the fit sort of nearish to condition score targets and certainly the fat ones would be doing a really good job on swords that look in sort of that slightly poorer quality and allow them to be reset before the autumn. In terms of quantity, so we've, Leslie's mentioned in terms of dry matter um, allocation. And so this is sort of some some versions of what that looks like in field. So we would be look, we would also be using sward height as an indicator of what's occurring on that field, but more and more farmers are starting to use kilos of dry matter per hectare. And it's just a way of describing how much grass is on that field. So the top image is around about four centimetres sward height, 
uh, and that equates to about 1500 kilos of dry matter per hectare. What's important to remember is that actually it's sheep can just about eat down to about 900 to 1000 kilos of dry matter. So there's only around about 500 available. So not all of that number is available to those sheep to eat. But that's about four centimetres top of the welly, the top of the welly toe, sorry. You've then moved up to about 2000 kilos of dry matter and it's just approaching sort of just at the sort of ankle level. And that equates to around about eight-ish centimetres, seven to eight centimetres, depending on the sward. Um, but again, really a nice amount of grass for sheep. When we move up to two and a half thousand kilos of dry matter per hectare, um, it's sort of 12-ish centimetres. What you can tend to see is if you look across a field at two and a half thousand, the, the leaves are just starting to bend over. The weight of them is sort of moving, is dragging them sort of um, down a bit. Um, so what we're really looking for in a weaned lamb situation is sort of probably not as low as 1500 and not as high as 2500. It's a bit like Goldilocks. So we want them to be around about 2000. If they're on a rotation, they might be taking it down to 1700. You might be putting them into that field at 22. So it's sort of in that range that we're looking at. If they, if certainly if grass is getting over 2500, it's starting um, the issues become utilisation, which means they're trampling through a lot of grass. They might be still able to choose the best bits, but it's always that balance between that and utilisation. So certainly we're wanting these the wean lambs to be around in fields around about 2000, depending on how you're managing that grazing system. So again, in terms of allocation, again, uh, some farmers are now starting to sort of think about dry matter allocation. So the table on the left hand side is sort of thinking about it in terms of the priority of those animals. So anything dry or mid pregnancy has a lower requirement for energy. So they have a lower allocation. Growing lambs are almost over allocated dry matter because we're wanting them to choose the best bits. So again, this is about trying to get maximum growth rates in those lambs. If the strategy for that farm is actually there's a store period and they want to finish them or grow them further on cover crops or crops that are coming in the autumn obviously um, you would still be allocating them a chunk of that body weight so in terms of for a 30 kilo lamb that equates to about 1.2 kilos of dry matter per hectare so for a group of 200 lambs that's 240 kilos of dry matter per hectare that needs to be allocated to that group when we know the pasture measurements, which we've just talked about in terms of that kilo of dry matter per hectare, we can start to use that to think about actually how long can that group of lambs be supported on that area? Um, how quickly can they return back to that field? And certainly rotations are based on this understanding of what the supply is from the pasture measurements and what the demand is from the group. This is some interest. This is some, uh, again coming out of the AHDB book that you can see on the at the bottom which is growing and finishing lambs for better return so we've got a ewe weight sorry lamb weight figure we've got a rough growth rate we've got potential dry matter intakes um, which we just talked through we've got metabolizable energy requirements so for example a 30 kilo lamb growing 250 grams needs about 13 megajoules of energy per day or 114 grams of uh, metabolizable protein per day so it gives you a feel for how much dry matter and the quality of that dry matter needs to be to satisfy that those growth targets and obviously the more energy they're supplying uh, generally the better um, better those growth rates are and vice versa so what we've got here is thinking about these specialist crops that these lambs may be going on to so we've got an example of white clover we've got red clover with some grass we've got some brassic crops we've got chicory over here and we've got plantain and What's important about thinking about specialist crops is not um, we're really interested in it from a growth rate potential for those lambs and how well they finish those lambs. We're also interested in about removing some of that demand, feed demand from the grazing platform to ensure that we can prioritise ewes. So Leslie mentioned the sort of that switch that happens between ewes and lambs at certain times of the year. And, and what we're interested in is, is prioritising grass for building body condition score on ewes and also setting up fields for topping and using these specialist crops that are that are high yielding means that we can move a lot of lambs off that grass area and save as much as we can for the ewes um, up to topping and then obviously through into winter 
Leslie mentioned in terms of transition onto these crops. So the key with this, and we talked about leaving the lambs where they are, taking the ewes away, potentially batching them up into group size, um, between maybe less than 30, 30 to 35, greater than 35. I know this year some people are selecting lambs at 35 just because of the price, but generally we're interested in this sort of batching approach and it means that you can really prioritise which groups go to which crop. So when we've sort of, we've allowed the lambs to settle, we may have treated them, we may not have, um, and then they've been batched up. So in terms of transition onto all of these crops is about trying to prevent hungry animals going onto them. Um, and it's also making sure there's a provision of fresh water and also fibre available to, for those sort of, to allow them to adjust their sort of seek, seeking out um, behaviour for long fibre. So, and the plan really with all of these is, is that really careful transition across to them, probably allowing two to three weeks for them to settle onto them before um, sort of they recover that period of, of growth. What's important to think about that is that if you've got lambs that are quite close to finishing, so two to three weeks away, potentially, these are not the animals to move on to these crops. It takes them too long to adjust. And hopefully by the time they've adjusted, um, they may be gone or they may have been, their growth mates may have been upset. So just think about what group of animals. So is it the mid range lambs that are going to go onto these crops? Is it the slightly heavy ones, but you can expect a slight uh, sort of a couple of weeks of transition onto these onto these crops and some there's also farms that are now mixing doing a variety of these up so it could be some clovers it could be plantain and chicory and again they're probably grazing them the sword heights i mentioned before for grass start to be not quite how we want to measure manage some of these crops so we're tending to be looking at slightly higher sward heights um, they're not certainly not going to go down to 1500 plate meters and sword sticks won't necessarily work very well on these crops so it's just thinking about how best to record that it could be just on sword height um, certainly going into chicory or plantain based crops at 25 centimeters is not necessarily a bad thing while it wouldn't work for a grass based sward so it's also thinking about how these specialist crops fit into the rotation um, and making sure there's enough of them on farm to in the they do need a rotation sort of animals need to graze them graze them down and then they need a rest period so if the field isn't big enough to maintain a rotation the challenge is that lambs settle onto the crop they move back, potentially back onto grass they then settle on grass and they have to be moved back onto this crop and that can be quite disruptive to their growth rate so again think about how it fits into the wider crop pattern but also making sure you batch the right number of lambs onto it to ensure that they can sort of um, their rotation can with can be maintained on that area. So, but certainly that in terms of growth rates, um, we would like to do in terms of good performances occurring on red clover, chicory, plantain, white. So all of them, are hopefully, you're going to get to 200, 250, depending on what age of lamb they are. Uh, again, and also depending on the contamination levels and various factors, but they you would be expecting good animal performance on these types of crops. So this is the bad analogy I use on with farmers, which is about letting them choose the best bits, and that works also on a grass-based rotation or grass and clover-based rotation. Um, we generally, if if farmers are, are wanting to try start rotational grazing, the suggestion is actually using is starting with a weaned lamb group just it's a bit easier especially compared to using lambs is that you can you can manipulate the numbers quite easily potentially you're selling lambs out of it so you can you can change group size significantly easier than you can do with using lambs um, but you are asking those lambs to to go through and choose the best bits you're not asking them to work hard or bring that residual down to that sort of four centimeters you're allowing them to work to go through that rotation choose the best bits and then the job as a grazier is to then think about what option is coming behind them to maintain quality so some people would use a leader follower system so the lambs go through first choose the best bits and they're followed either potentially by a thinner dry ewe group or maybe cows and calves and they're the ones that are asked to work a bit harder to sort of take that down and then as those animals leave it's then given a rest period for before the lambs come back around again and it is about thinking about how to reset that pasture and a lot of the time 
we can't use growing or finishing animals to do that. We have to use a second class of stock that are asked to do to work harder to to sort of um, take those residuals and to reset them. So the key points for me really is to identify the pinch points of the system. So is it you body condition score? Is it grass quality? Is it grass quantity? It may all be all three of them. Um, Think about energy intake, then protein intake, then parasites, and then trace elements. And generally on a graged forage system, so be that grass, be it clove, is that protein is rarely a limiting factor, but it is worth thinking about that. I've mentioned about dividing lambs into groups based on target weights, um, and then think about these specialist finishing crops, but, uh, but think about how they fit into that rotation and make sure there is enough of the... A, big enough area to maintain a group on them so they don't have to keep moving off it. And that is me. So what we'll do now is I'll stop sharing um, and we'll go through some questions. So I'll ask the questions that came for Leslie and Pete while I gather my thoughts. So Leslie, in terms of, there's a question for Gar uh, Graham Lofthouse, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. In your experience, do you see a significant rise in faecal egg counts post weaning due to stress, even though that pre weaning faecal egg counts would suggest treatment was not necessary? Yeah, I mean, I think good point, Graham. Yeah, you, you can see that. I think what you've got to remember is that the pre weaning faecal egg count um, is, you know, because we get such a very we get such a variation in faecal egg count between animals, because at that stage you're going to be having I mean, some animals will be developing an acquired immunity, others won't. Um, and the ones that are doing well and growing well are acquiring their immunity and they're beginning to regulate their worm burden. So, of course, what the immune system does is it regulates the worm burden by not allowing some to establish others. It stunts and, other, and then the others, it actually, with the egg laying females, it actually reduces the number of eggs they can shed. That's what the immune system is doing. So, of course, what happens is at weaning, there will be some stress. Uh, we talked a bit about, I've talked a bit about, and Liz certainly has about um, reducing some of that stress. But if you stress the animal, the immune system will go backwards and that will allow the worm burden on board to produce more eggs. I think what you have to remember is that that doesn't necessarily mean that the worm burden is doing any more harm to the animal. It's just allowing what's on board to, it's uh, taking the brakes off egg production, if you like. Um, so um, I would expect to see it in some animals, uh, but then I would make sure I monitored it downstream more just to make sure um, that it wasn't a problem developing uh, and try and do all the things that we've talked about in terms of transition and quality of forage to keep the growth rate up. But that's why you're seeing it, because it will be a dent on that, um, their ability to control and what's starting in terms of their required immunity. Thank you. And just Graham's got a sort of follow on up. What, um, what do the speakers think about the group about group size and the effect of stress on both great and parasite challenges and how would they mitigate the effect, if any? So I'm guessing that's when you start to move groups of lambs together or rebatch them. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, allowing them to get over the actual stress of weaning for a few days is is the key thing. Um, you know, I mean, they're in their sibling groups, they're, they, they're in social groups and those when you mess those about, that is a serious stress. So just letting them settle before you mix them up. But inevitably, there is going to be a stress. And when you do what I would agree with you, Liz, you go through and you start doing your weight ranges because you want management for different targets for different groups. There will be a stress associated with that, which is a social um, type um, mental stress, if you like, on those animals. And, and, and you, you've just got to watch that. And uh, you know, if the food's good and they're, go and, and they're going on well and there aren't any other challenges and they're on a low contamination pasture, um, then we should be able to control it reasonably well. But, in, but we've got to try and minimise it. In terms of would you put a maximum group size you would run? together of lambs? Um, I think that's quite difficult because, you know, I mean, it depends what you've got available. And I would rather that we got the nutrition right. But I think, again, what we've got to remember is if you're going to go from lambs in, you know, not such big groups and you're suddenly going to put them in groups of two and three hundred, they are going to be stressed because they're not quite sure what they're doing. And so you know, it might be if you can, you could maybe group up a little bit more gradually. Um, but anything you can do like that and just bear in mind that those animals will be stressed if suddenly they find themselves in a strange group of three or four hundred 
animals on a different type of crop, not introduced properly, we're going to see problems. Let's not think about the big fields of store lamps no. we drive past. I mean, I mean, the, the other point I think to make is as well, and it doesn't happen so much nowadays, but, but everybody used to think in terms of, you know, vaccinating lambs at weaning as well. Don't do it because, you know, when they're stressed like that, the chances of them actually having a good response to a vaccine aren't great. So, you know, either get both in before you wean or get one in well before and then wait for the second booster. But, but don't give a vaccine at that time when they're under stress. Pete, I think you wanted to say something on that. No, I think this, this area of nutrition um, around the bat sizes and what you can do to care for them at that time, because they, you know, they've all, they're just making that transition not fully from a liquid, but the rumen still forming, what can we do to help that process? And um, I tend to think that, you know, that that's probably underestimated. And I think that's an area that we could do more with. Mm. Yeah, and, and it also depends on what they've been on. You know, as you made the point that, you know, competition between the ewes and the lambs, of course, um, and I, I didn't make the point I should have done, but I made 12 weeks the use making virtually no contribution to the, what the lamb is, is, is doing, despite what people think. But, you know, if they've been pushed um, and they've been pushed downhill through that competition and their dry matter intakes have been low and the pasture quality has been getting worse, then the stress will be greater when suddenly you present them something with a lot better. And I think the other thing, too, that you know, because just the nature of farming, you know, we, we sometimes are forced to make quick changes, but that rumen, you know, is three to four weeks and it's changing process from one food type to another. So that in itself is, 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 is the issue, I think. Mm. You're muted, Liz. I was up with Ben Strugnell recently and there was a lot of twisted guts coming in, even at this time of year. So that, I mean, that's the risk in terms of that really rapid through flow of that high quality dry matter and then causing yeah. problems further down. And if you go on some very high protein crops, you start to see red gut as well. You'll get that secondary fermentation and you'll get red gut and that is some pretty nasty too. So it, it, as you say, it's all about transition, feet, isn't it? And, uh, you know, remembering if you change your room and then ruminant substrate significantly you're effectively starving that animal um yeah. until it can readjust uh, and yeah um we've got a question thanks Lucy. sorry <laughs> um we've got a question for pete in terms of um from kirsten would you look to element imbalances imbalances even for higher instances of prolapses don't you know my we're response. smiling because we were, we're having a chat about this a while ago yeah we we so uh, i'm sure this won't mind me saying but um so this is a subject that has come across my desk more than once in the last four weeks and certainly liz myself um and others have been speaking about the relevance of um perhaps the increased level of potassium in the diet and does that make any dis uh, difference and the cation exchange level of the diet. I think the kindest thing to say to anybody is the jury is out, but I am getting more phone calls about it than I've ever had. So I think it's time that um, when we get time, some of us will be sitting down and scratching our heads. And I'm sure it's not just one thing, but it is, it is, on, my, uh, it is on my radar very much at the moment. Thank you. And I just I think it's interesting that um, well, certainly we've found a bit from New Zealand where that with that calcium imbalance seems to be one of the risk factors. But there's a list of 10 other risk factors that are associated with prolapse. And so I think well, it's not about necessarily solving it; it's just about providing some options in terms of testing for it. And I think I'm also interested in effective, the most effective treatments for it, because there's obviously a bit of variation. In, yes. um, but I think particularly this year, we seem to have more explosive prolapses than we had other years. And mm. there's theories about higher condition use going into winter. And 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 it's there's just so many factors involved in it. But certainly this year seemed to be a, a higher prolapse year. Yes, definitely. I think, um, again, you know, like we just the three of us are discussing generally it is the multifactorial approach. But I think I'm not wanting to speak for my two colleagues speaking this evening, but I think we all do come from the same page as being very open minded, but trying to home in or with good science or good testing to take 
you to the best possible outcomes, you being the consultant, you being the farmer, whatever it may be. Um, and then there's a follow another one on minerals. Ooh, there we go. There's another one on minerals, which is about uh, from Jan Ledoux about increased use of sulfur in fertilizer. So we're seeing an excess in the animal, or so are we getting luxury uptake of sulfur? Is it? Yeah, you know, I'm not making any but, sense. Of, yeah, it, it, it does make sense. So in terms of trying to answer that question, I think that um, quite rightly, many um, people advising on fertilizer levels will be talking about perhaps in some instances, a lowering of the sulfur within the atmosphere, which is quite correct. So therefore, do we need to supply more to the crop? In many cases, we probably do. We do need to have um, some thought, in my opinion, for not outbalancing that sulfur or making it too aggressive in the crop for several reasons. One, sulfur and selenium share the same body pathway uptake mechanisms. So we don't want sulfur depressing selenium uptake. Secondly, um, sulfur itself, uh, if overfed, can cause quite serious problems in the rumen, um, uh, microbial growth, etc. We know that it can be connected to CNN as well. So there's that. And then there comes the very interesting link um, to do with excess sulfur and copper and copper utilization. So it's about balance to answer that question, Liz. But I think what I would try to leave the people with is the message of, yes, consider sulfur for the correct reasons. But if you're looking to target in a grazing platform or a conserved forage, I really wouldn't want to see it much over 0.25% uh, in the final product, and particularly those farms that have a potency to have higher molybdenum areas, then I would think twice about taking that sulfur um, too high within applications of hard fertilizer or liquids or single um, macro elements. Just be careful what you're doing. And the challenge, I mean, we know grass is very responsive to sulphur and we know that it, it I mean, there's certainly yield benefits in a, in a multi-cut system, but we also know that from a, in a grey system, there's quite a lot of returns from organic, well, basically dung, isn't there? So it's also the debate of how much, what are the recommendations for sulphur in a grey yeah. situation? It is. Um, and sometimes it's because they've got some fertiliser left with a bit more sulphur in than they need. Yeah. I think we've also got to remember as well that sulfur is an extremely good thiaminase and, and we see quite a lot of CCN as a result of sulfur levels being too high. It's really very successful at precipitating CCN, uh, which of course you get no warning for. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, you just got to, it's like Pete says, it's all a question of getting that balance right and not going over the top. Mm. And I, I think probably if I could, it's, it's difficult because I, I look at it from an animal point of view and the people with us this evening will look at it from increasing dry matter intake, protein level, levels, um, nitrogen utilization, sulfur ratio, which is all correct. But really what we're talking about here tonight is a big clock face. And on that clock face, we're bringing in things that are good and things that are bad. And on that clock face is the cycle, if you like, of the production. And I suppose it's bringing in those little bits to try to just make you think, have I done that or have I done that? And that's, if I leave tonight with making you think, I probably haven't done a bad job. You've made John Pringle think, good link there. Um, <laughs> can you elaborate further on the zinc cobalt tie up? Yeah, so I think, as you remember, this probably came up in a, another thing that we were doing not all that long ago. So, um, Obviously, I, I wouldn't want to sit in front of any of you tonight and dismiss the importance of cobalt and vitamin B12 and then link to what Leslie has just said. Um, but if you start to read the history of the papers, there seems to be quite a lot of commonality between the um, signs of zinc deficiency and cobalt deficiency in animals. So uh, quite often, I think, um, you know, I will go and instigate tests for cobalt. And actually, it comes back fine. So have we been looking at the right thing? So all I'm doing is opening the debate around zinc, its importance with sheep, because I think it's vitally important. But um, we always face a challenge with use is getting it into the right level in the right form. 
So just making sure that we are looking at the right diagnostics with the right signs that we see. That's really what I'd say um, to, sorry, I've lost track of who asked the question, but yeah, just, just it's think. Just, it's it. worth, and that, and it could be, yeah. so it can be picked up in a blood test if you request the zinc levels. Yeah, it is. And that that's a challenge for us all. It, it's with our veterinary friends with us tonight is, you know, working as a team and actually trying to say, we think this might be a problem. Our evidence suggests it could be. Our signs and symptoms say we could be. So do we actually stick a needle in for zinc? And remembering that zinc as a micro element is not storable. Thank you. And there's just one one we carry on the just the theme of trace elements. Is there any room for manipulating forage quality with with fertilizer applications of yeah. trace elements? I did, I did luckily read that question before you asked it. So um, this is starting to get very interesting. So um, basically, I think this is probably what I said about soil earlier. So soil will not always mirror in the crop directly. So can we then um, apply hard fertilizer product or can we apply foliar applications to improve? The answer is yes, we can do it. Um, some of the commercial businesses have got some quite good um, data, particularly around cobalt applications to growing forages for young lambs. So that there are areas we can do that. It's worthwhile, but there's a small problem around um, our industry, it's called pH. Liz, you're a proponent of good soils and pH, and so am I. And we have to then remember, if we put it on the top, does it stay in the crop? Does it translocate back into the soil? Can we, if you like, recycle it? So my view would be, yes, we can look at this, but soil would become my medium to long-term management to try to improve it. But I think somebody said this doesn't happen quickly, Leslie, and it doesn't. This is a it's, it's a very interesting topic, but it's also one that um, is very timely to correct. Thank you. Um, I just quickly answer. So Richard's asked one about the bounce back brassicas, which I'm guessing are the multi grays uh, like rape kale hybrids. So um, he's mentioned Skyfall. There's other things like um, Red Star, I suppose, is the most is a common one as well. The ambition of that is you graze it uh, lightly, taking the leaves off, feed it a little bit and it recovers and can be regrazed within about six, six about six weeks. Um, really useful, always to do with with brassicas. And I should have mentioned before is is making sure it's matured before those animals go on to it. Well, there can be some nice issues involving nitrate poisoning and issues with photosensitization. So um, it's a really nice crop to have in and those options. Um, it's best to sort of try and graze it late summer for the first time. So it has six weeks of where it can regrow well. Do you mean if you as you as you plant it to be grazed later in the year, that ability to regraze it and to any secondary yield is, is reducing. So it's just always to do with timing, working out when you need that crop, work back based on maturity date, and that's when your estimated drilling time should be. Um, so yeah, interesting, but just making sure they fit and there's enough time really. Um, so on the one for Leslie, really, if ewes are or over conditioned and there is no shortage of quality grazing, is there any benefit of weaning later than 12 weeks? I would say no, um, because I think, you know, you saw that graph and we really need to be taking control of both the ewes and the lambs at that stage. So if they're over conditioned, you're not going to get condition off them. That's not something that's going to happen. But equally, the, what we didn't look at, we've got evidence within the KPI project that when ewes are over the top, obviously you get the negative effect. Things start to drop down the other way. We've already talked about prolapses. And, you know, one of the factors that we think was playing this winter was um, ewes that were too fat. Um, so I think, you know, you've, you've, you've got to look at weaning around about that 12 week stage to take control. You need to be planning, you need that time. You can keep the ewes tight, um, try not to let them get any fatter. If they're over conditioned, you certainly don't want them to get any fatter and to give the lambs the priority. So I think from a planning point of view, you know, weaning is the start of the next year and to keep delaying it, you know, how do you keep pasture quality? How do you actually keep things going in front of them? The worm burden, which we've mentioned, 
which if it's on grazing that the ewes and lambs have been on since the spring, you saw that great big rush of larvae that are going to come in the second half of the season. We want to try and get lambs away from that. So, um, you know, that that is the, with farmers, there's, there's, there's two schools of thought. You will hear farmers say in a very dry way when there's no, when there's no grass, oh, well, I'm going to use leave the lambs on the ewes because that's where they need to be. They're going to get something false they're not they're just going to get each in each other's way and probably what they should be doing is maybe thinking about selling some lambs um and then the other one is where they're, they're too fit oh well, it doesn't matter i don't need to worry about you condition and again they lose control of both the ewes and the lambs so i i, I would make the plea on my experience and i'm not going to tell you how many years because liz will think that's hilarious um that it, it always pays um, to plan ahead and to think in terms of weaning around about that 12 weeks. I think this year I'm already talking to, I mean, I've been pushing a lot of my guys, given where we are and the, the, the really funny grass pattern that we've had. You know, A, we've had to chuck a bit of creep in, take it back out now, um, but we are looking at weaning earlier um, because, you know, some of these ewes have taken a beating. Others haven't. Huge variation between farms as to whether the ewes have had a beating or not. So it, it, it's a, take it on an individual basis. Short answer is no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it's not really a question, but uh, Emily's kindly put in a link to some further work on or further reading on um, prolapses if people are interested in that. Um, just in the last few minutes again thank you very much Pete thank you very much Leslie really interesting loads of really interesting questions so thanks everybody for those I've just got a handful of slides that I just need to put back up um, so Denise, just in before you do before you finish off can I just muscle my way, way in and uh, just say a, a couple of very brief words and I will keep it really brief but I just want to thank um, you all for um, presenting tonight I think it's been a really informative um, and a very thought provoking um, hour. So thank you very much. And this really marks um, yeah, the start of what is a really significant day for me, which is the, the launch of Rosa. I mean, Liz has mentioned that already. I'm sure she'll say a few more words in a moment, but it is for me a really significant day. And, uh, you know, I think, I don't think there's anyone amongst us that wouldn't agree that um, farming is gonna go through change like we've probably never seen in our, in our lifetimes. And I just think that that's a, a, a big, burden for any individual farmer to bear on their own you know I think there will be a much much greater appetite for advice consultancy guidance and support um, I think there'll be a, a, a bigger appetite for it, and I certainly think there's a real need for it in the future so you know my view is that Rosa is a, a, a new initiative that is very much um, of its time and uh, you know we'll be working very hard to try and make sure that um, it is a real success one of our collective challenges, I guess, is going to be about demonstrating the value, isn't it? It's going to be about making sure that we see a, a far greater uptake of, um, of, uh, of, of, of trusted expertise on, on farms. Um, and that will be across the whole spectrum of uh, technical subjects like we've listened to tonight, but also, you know, linking in with the new uh, government schemes as they come out in the future as well. So I think it's very much of the time. I'd just like to thank everyone for joining and thank uh, you three for some great presentations and Liz in particular, you for um, a lot of background work in terms of getting Rosa to where it is today. Uh, and I'll pass back to you to, uh, to wrap up. Thanks. So let's see if I can do this <laughs> the third time. Uh, right, hopefully you can see the right bit. Yeah, you're up Liz. Perfect. So this is um, just a, sort of further hint that one point uh so the whole the reason why we did the webinar today obviously it's a topical ish topical area but also that the rosa launched today so if you go to this website you can join um one point is available for attending this webinar on that obviously you're not necessarily a member yet you might apply today but you're not necessarily a member and we'll keep a log of who turned up or who sorry who turned up who was on the call this evening and then you'll be awarded your one point once the membership goes through um the other thing to think about is if you do run courses like this for other people so webinars or activity even with within your own organization and, and to sort of share knowledge within your company that can also be awarded rosa points and so if you become a member you can also get it from internal uh, courses you can get it from a wide range of um, sort of activity so being members of various organizations uh, 
reading journals, reading magazines. So it's worth really having a look through in terms of what are the different options you can get points for. But my plea is that if you do organise courses like this or technical content for websites or publications, it would be worth to register with Rosa as a CPD provider. Uh, again, visit the website and there's information of how you can do that. Um, there is some sort of flow back of information that Rosa needs to make sure we can log those, the details of those people who attended. Um, but again, everything can be that you're after can be found on the website. If you can't find it, please email sheepadvisors at basis-reg.co.uk and please follow us on Sheep Advisors on Twitter. Again, thanks very much for everybody. Thanks for the questions. I hope you have an enjoyable rest of the evening. Thanks for now.